Hi there, welcome to one more episode of the Old Plane Podcast, where aviation innovators and entrepreneurs share the coolest projects they are working on. And remember, you can find all the previous episodes of this podcast, as well as many other aviation stories on our website, oldplane.tv. That is A L L P L A N E dot T V. Today on the podcast, Equator Aircraft, an electric seaplane startup that, despite its name, is not located anywhere near the equator, but in the much colder latitudes of Norway. When Thomas Brotherskift was a boy, his father self-built an aircraft. And today, he's more or less following the same path, because Thomas is the founder and CEO of Equator Aircraft, based on our drive south of Oslo, in Norway's southern coast, Thomas and his team have been working the last few years in the development of a light, electrically powered seaplane. It certainly hasn't been a smooth ride. Startups are hard, and building aircraft perhaps even more so. But its first prototype, a two-seater, flew already in 2019, and while they still have much to work on before going to market, they have already started planning for an even larger four-seater seaplane, where you will even be able to fit a mountain bike or a kayak. It is a very sleek and cool design. It might remind some of you of the Icon A5 seaplane, but electric. A seaplane like this might be ideal for a country like Norway, with great outdoors and where water is literally everywhere. Thomas has also a whole bunch of projects and ideas around this aircraft that he's going to share with us today. So let's listen to him. Hello, Thomas. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks so much for the quick response to my invitation to uh, join this podcast. I learned recently about your project, which I found very interesting because I pay close attention to what's going on in Scandinavia. Uh, particularly mm. Norway, uh, mm. a leader in sustainable aviation and electric aviation in particular. You are the founder of uh, Equator Aviation, very exciting project, which is a, a seaplane, an electric seaplane in mm. Norway. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and this project and what are you guys trying to do? Yes, yeah, so I'm... Um... I, uh, I started uh, flying very early in my life. I come from a family that has uh, that interest. My father built the plane very early in my life as well. Uh, I think I was three years old when he built his first uh, experimental aircraft. Wow. So <laughs> I... <laughs> that, that's not something that uh, everyone can say, yeah? No. <laughs> <laughs> Building an actually, aircraft. It, it actually took me quite a long time until I understood that not everybody had an aircraft in their family, you know, it was yeah. like, quite natural to, yeah, yeah. to go for a flight and, so and a family, go for trips. Family tradition to build aircraft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but I also grew up in the, the community uh, with uh, home builds in, in Norway uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. So I was always subjected to all these uh, very interesting types of planes because uh, you know, the home built sector of aircraft is actually, it has some of the more, if you look at performance wise, it's some of the more interesting airplanes out there. I think uh, from the long easy that my father has, that is a very unique airplane, a canard airplane to, to uh, the Lancer and, uh, and these types of planes to, uh, to bush planes and all kinds of uh, planes in between. So I, I was always very fascinated by that. Um, uh, to make a long story short, I eventually chose to study uh, product design, industrial design. Um, uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't directly focused on becoming an aerospace engineer or something early in life. I was more interested in uh, creating uh, objects and products. I I've always been interested in building things. Uh, but of course, as a pilot on the side, I was always very keen to kind of view, look at challenges in the aviation industry as, to, as well. And uh, I think the more I studied industrial design and learned about the human factors, the man-machine interaction, the more 
critical I got to to uh, all kinds of products actually and I, I saw I, I see improvements uh, potential improvements in most things that we have around us and uh, and I think uh, in the aviation sector it actually is a very unique situation because there is no industry that has more need for industrial design and uh, more design input than this industry it is a very it's a very uh, conform and static type of industry and that was my feeling back in 2007 2010 when when i eventually during my studies got in contact with a very uh, in my mind a very great uh, aircraft designer named Günther Pöschel in germany i studied both in norway and germany and he uh, he introduced me to some of these very, very interesting seaplane concepts that he had worked on through his career. He was an older guy back then, uh, uh, coming up to about 80 years old. And uh, I was firstly blown away because I hadn't seen any of his airplanes throughout my life. You know, I'd, I'd, uh, mm-hmm. I'd seen magazines and, and, and watched everything that happened since I was a kid. And I had never seen his, his aircraft. Uh, and uh, I was a little bit struck by that because he built six seat uh, fully composite aircraft in uh, 1969. So he was actually before Bert Rutan and all these uh, composite guys that are written in the history books as the first to, to utilize this material. So of course, when I was in Germany, I had to get in, in touch with him. He turned out to be a very, very interesting uh, person. And I, I went to visit him quite often to, to learn about his, uh, his designs, his story, uh, how he got involved with this. And, and I was very inspired by this, uh, this meeting because uh, I found a guy that also wasn't educated in the field. He was a mechanical engineer and not an aerospace engineer. And, and he had done a lot of self-teaching to get to his, uh, his concepts. And then uh, when I saw that that was possible, and I also learned about all the amazing experiences he had had through his uh, career, I felt like maybe this is something that we should also, or I should also try to do. Uh, and uh, that's why our company has the same name. So Equator is uh, originally the old uh, company from this guy in Germany. Okay. So we are trying to kind of continue a little bit the legacy of uh, Ginter Pöschel and, uh, and his aircraft as well. Yeah, actually, that's one of the things I had noted down to, to ask you during our conversation, because you na- your name Equator, but you are based in Norway, which is a bit far from the equator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah. as far as it gets, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, where, where are you based in Norway exactly? In what part of Norway? So we we're based right. Uh, we were based very close to Oslo, but now we have moved down to Tønsberg, which is about one hour south along the coast on okay. the um, on basically the west side of the fjord, going into mm-hmm. Oslo. A small little airport there where we have a hangar and uh, an office. Norway. Well, looking at the map, it looks like an ideal place for a uh, for the seaplane, right? Because you have all these fjords oh, yeah. and. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing. If you look at how much bodies of water it is, it's, it, it's incredible. Uh, you have uh, 450,000 freshwater lakes. Uh, yeah. I was surprised myself that it was this amount. Uh, that's one thing. And, and with the fjords, you get this huge coastline with the fjords, you know, uh, yes. in the kilometers. So, it, so uh, it, 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 it is a good place. Easier to move by water and air than by land because you have all these mountains as well blocking the yeah. main uh, yeah. communication way. So yeah, yeah. Makes- so 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 it's like that as a private pilot in Norway. I usually say you can fly any direction for ten minutes, and it's extreme flying because you are always over forests and, and mountains. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's always been a very it's always been a very a thought that has hit my mind just for safety reasons to be able to to land on the on the on the water in the mountains if, mm-hmm. in in case something happens with the motor or something you know mm-hmm. so you've been working on this project for already a few years uh, oh I, actually a long time really because uh, if you look uh, if uh, when i when i went to germany and met this guy i went back to norway and finished my diploma and my diploma uh, task master thesis was this uh, this concept for this uh, aircraft 
okay. which was ta- I took a lot of his uh, ideas and I mixed them in with with uh, more industrial design focused ideas, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, interesting uh, yeah, cockpit uh, ideas on how to simplify the experience of flights, etc. And I merged this together in, in this concept that I call the P2, mm-hmm. uh, which is a smaller version of the planes that uh, Ginter originally uh, made, which was made more for my category of uh, type uh, people that I knew that flew. So it's a small sport aircraft, you know, similar to the Icom in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, a two-seater, yeah. uh, 700 kilos, uh, max takeoff weight, uh, et cetera. It's in the same category. One thing that stands out, I must say, is that the design is very sleek and mm. very sporty and, mm. and, and very, has very nice lines. I mean, of course, I'm going to post some pictures and, and video in the show notes. But um, what can you tell us from, from a technical point of view? It's uh, the aircraft you have designed so far. It's, it's a prototype, right? So it exists. It's, it has yeah. flown. It has flown yeah. already in 2019, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's called the P2 excursion, and yeah, just to give a reference to the listeners, if they are familiar, as you mentioned, the A5 Icon, which is a, mm. it's a similar, mm. similar concept, but mm. yours is electric. So yes, it's yes. an electric aircraft. Although it has a version, you can add a range extender, which can be powered by biofuel. Yeah, I have to explain a little bit there because yeah. you can. If you can imagine back in 2010 when this concept was developed uh, and designed, um, the situation back then was that there was almost nobody doing electric planes in this category. So for me to envision a type of concept that could come to market quite fast, I knew that it wouldn't be possible on 2010 battery technology. And that's why we started working towards doing a a hybrid system. And uh, we spent a lot of time trying to make a generator that would fit and that would weigh the right amount and uh, everything you need to to make a drivetrain like that. But uh, I have to admit that the idea was always a pure electric uh, aircraft uh, because we all, we all know that the batteries are getting better. Uh, but because of the timing and the way things w- was back then, it didn't seem like that was possible in the short term. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to, to make a system that could be uh, commercialized uh, more rapidly. And we found a generator that could also do all kinds of kerosene, biofuel, uh, jet fuel, uh, everything kerosene based, which was very interesting to me as a, a, a basically a vanco running a, a generator. But I have to admit also that uh, the hybrid systems are extremely complex. It, uh, it ended up being a very, very complex and long project where we 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 have not yet found uh, we have not yet tested it enough to feel comf- comfortable enough to put it in the plane so uh, we ended up i think 3 years before the first flight we we ended up shifting our strategies a lot because things had taken a long time we had been building and designing for 6 years and and then we figured okay how can we get in the air as quickly as possible and then we just put batteries inside uh, but the aircraft ba- is basically ready for the hybrid system. It has a fuel tank, all the systems around the fuel tank, the fixtures for the motor and all these, pe- uh, these pieces, the engine box inside the plane and everything is ready. So it was uh, probably uh, many, many thousand hours that went into dealing with the hybrid, but we ended up testing electric. And today it seems like, you know, with today's battery state, to, we're approaching 250 watt hours per kilo. It's really starting to look like we can actually make a, a viable electric aircraft that we don't need a hybrid for. Mm-hmm. And because I know now the complexity of the hybrid system as well, I'm not sure if I would recommend investors to kind of put money into the, that at the moment. I would rather do a pure electric drive train simply because the mechanics of it is just so simple. The, the the test that you have on YouTube that you can see the videos yeah. they are all electric those flights were yeah. all 100% electric uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. and to yeah. recap on the technical characteristics of the P2 excursion so it's a two seater so there's a pilot and a passenger it's an amphibious plane so it can land on water and mm. on land I saw some numbers and I was quite impressed it's a 200 200 kilometer range 
Yeah, right. it would it it would be uh, with uh, with a, a state of the art battery pack. We still have quite an old battery pack uh, that is getting and it's getting older, you know, all the time. So, uh -huh. um, it, we don't have a battery pack that is optimized to fly a long endurance. So, we, but we get about you know thirty thirty five minutes on this particular pack mm -hmm. right now for testing. And uh, you know, when you, we fly at one hundred and twenty, one hundred and thirty knots, so of course you get you get some range out of that mm -hmm. but uh, it's not 200 kilometers uh, on this prototype right now but if we exchange the batteries one to one with new cells uh, we would get more similar range to that i think but uh, <clears throat> i also have to say that because the aircraft was built in the fashion it was the way i mean it, it was in a small garage we were only a few people and uh, we used a lot of hand layup methods with the composite it's not uh, not high-end pre-preg uh, uh, finished molds and everything and machine molds it's all it was all moldless construction etc so you gain a lot of extra weight through that process so the aircraft is actually heavier than it would be in a production version as well so we don't have so much we can't put so much extra batteries inside we're kind of on the limit there so so it's not it's really just for testing purposes and to use it to as a demonstrator for technology uh and uh, i mean we spend composites. i think composites, yeah, com so. car carbon composites yeah uh, yeah all around so so yeah you can say it should be lightweight but when you do the hand layup and not the you don't use vacuum molding a lot and things like that you get 10 to 15 percent extra resin mm -hmm. in all the parts you make more or less because you don't get this pressure so so uh, automatically the weight will be a little bit higher in the end and and that is a limitation in this prototype and uh, you know it was also a it was also a learning process for us right because uh, i had never it was the first aircraft design i made and uh, and uh, all the other in the team had never done a plane before so we were doing a lot of trial and error throughout the process. So you're building a part that you have to change and you change it three times and then you add, of course, materials and stuff. It's not very optimized, but uh, it's you do what you have to do to get in the air in the end, right? And so that's the most important point is to prove the concept. That's what I wanted to do. And so, you, build, you build it yourself, both the airframe and the engine? <clears throat> the engine was the design developed by uh, Engiro in Germany. So we commissioned them to build a 100 kilowatt uh, electric motor back in 2012. Uh, we got some state support then, so we got a little bit of funding through through the Norwegian state, and that was used to develop this uh, this motor and the batteries and the controlling unit, etc. And again, you know, uh, I, it was not my ambition to make an electric motor. That's uh, you know, I, I don't think. Uh, companies should mix too much the propulsion and the airframing. It's two very, very large projects. But uh, it's back to the state of the world at that time, you know. There weren't any 100 kilowatts motors available. I couldn't buy them off the shelf. So if we needed this power, we had to find a way to do it. And that ended up being this project where we, ha where we had to make this motor. Now, the idea was maybe to certify it, but as, as time went on, you know, uh, you have a lot of propulsion manufacturers out there now developing a lot of nice electric motors. So today I would rather buy something than to spend the money on certification of our own unit. Uh, don't really see the point today to do that. I would rather uh, use something that is already either certified or in the process of being certified and, uh, and uh, getting somewhere. That is, uh, that is quite interesting today because you have five, six uh, companies that are very close to certification. So It's 100 kilowatt uh, right now. What would be your ideal, uh, the optimal for an aircraft? Well, it's a, it's a weight issue, right? And it's also a C, the C part where, where you want to pull the aircraft out of the sea. Of course, uh, in that particular situation, you want to have as much power as you can possibly get, right? But... Uh, but 100, 100 kilowatts or 130 horsepower is is uh, is uh, okay for this type of weight. It's uh, more or less the same as the C Ray or the Icon A5 or other airplanes. But um, yeah, so I don't think it's uh, we we could we could we could have a little bit more to get faster out of the water. But uh, I don't think it's it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You define this prototype as a as a sort of SUV vehicle. Oh. What's the main public you're addressing? Is this recreational people that might yeah. use it? I mean, even the naming, I mean, you name it the excursion. So it, 
it looks like a cool <laughs> cool vehicle you can you can use to go in the, out yeah. in the fjords maybe or something yeah. like that right yeah, yeah yeah the idea was to make uh, yeah like an suv type uh, vehicle uh, but a real i say real sport utility because the sport part means that you're efficient and fast and the utility part means that it has huge capability to bring things and people uh, so, you know, things like sleeping inside the plane, bringing bicycles, mountain bikes, etc. in the back, uh, being big enough to house all of this, that was kind of the new things with this concept, really. And that's what people would have noticed if they ever flew this aircraft, is that it's, uh, it's larger, it's uh, much more spacious, and you have this huge room in the back for all your equipment and everything. And you can put down the seats and sleep inside, and yeah, so you can proper fit a sport utility. Yeah, you can fit a mountain bike in the back. Wow. Yeah, it, it was designed around the sizes of the objects to to put in the back there. So <laughs> interesting. A paddle surf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah? you know, I have in one illustration, you know, a canoe that goes from the nose all the way back. You know, so it's in in the passenger seat. You know, can have a canoe there instead. Wow. So that really cool. So, so, so that was uh, it was like this true sport utility because sport utility in, in aviation is often linked to bush planes but they are extremely slow and inefficient and that's that's missing the sport part in my mind <laughs> and you're planning to sell it to to the general public to private users yeah no it, in the beginning it, uh, those the mar the market questions are pretty difficult you know i, I tried to make something for uh, specifically for like uh, the pilots that i kind of recognized uh, around me in my environment that people always seems like everybody wants to fly seaplanes but they they never they never go that direction because the seaplanes are so inefficient and expensive they're more complex to to operate right i mean i I've, I've been speaking with yeah. several seaplane operators here in in this podcast and they all highlight this the yes yeah. i had the chance to speak with um rob seravolo that runs a seaplane operation in florida and he told me one of the main things was the training because yeah. you you had yeah. to to create this pool of pilots that were mm. certified to to fly on were trained to fly on seaplanes so i guess yeah. that's and extra. I mean, I mean, uh, the the train training is very difficult because you're 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 really it it, it is much more dangerous than flying uh, from the ground. I mean, there are so many uh, so many factors in the sea that is more complicated to deal with. Uh, it's basically a runway that's never the same. Yeah. You know, it's always different. So uh, you 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 can't make mistakes really. It seems mm -hmm. like, especially on float planes, it seems like it doesn't have a lot of. Uh, leeway on mistakes so you can you can get an accident very rapidly so that's one part of the equation so in our case we tried to make a seaplane where we got the weight really low so that was the idea to put the batteries the motors and everything down in the hull instead of having it like high up mm -hmm. to balance the plane properly and then of course we had this uh, we have this float wing idea that uh, that Günther Pöschel also suggested and also um, was used in in other aircraft like the Coot aircraft and uh, and other planes through history. But uh, it's basically a wing that floats in the water. So it, yeah, the it Russian be... the Russian company Beriev also uses something similar. And that's to that's to be a, able to go away from all the extra geometries you know, need to stabilize this this plane in water. And that's uh, and that that's the hard part with seaplane design is to be able to uh, to reduce the compromise between land and sea. On, on all aspects, really, uh, you try to reduce the compromise on performance. You know, seaplanes typically might be 30% worse in performance than a land plane. So it's trying to get closer to the land plane mm -hmm. with the idea that if people had the opportunity to buy a seaplane where they didn't have to compromise too much on price, on performance, then they would always choose the seaplane. Because mm. the, most pilots all, would like to have that opportunity to to land on the water, but um, mm -hmm. but the compromise is too big. I understand that. I myself am I've been flying land planes for the most part, and uh, and I understand why. You know, uh, so I wanted to make a plane that kind of reduced the compromise, is an efficient flyer, is similar to other LSAs in the market, and uh, also very safe on the water. Safer. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a it's not an aircraft you use in big waves or anything like that, but it it has the capability to land on water when you need it, or you have the safety factor of flying in the mountains. You can if something happens, you can land on the water, mm -hmm. etc. Do you so. have a a price range 
for this to go to the market? Yeah, we we ended up estimating the production price of uh, of this or or a similar production type would be in the region of two hundred and thirty thousand euros. That's my assumption based mm -hmm. on the knowledge that I have today. And then of course I see that Lisa in France and the Icon is way above three hundred thousand now. Uh, so I also acknowledge that maybe I'm underestimating some of the some of the processes in production. Mm -hmm. um, the costly part of doing composite aircraft is labor. It's labor intensive. We don't have machines to do the work. So there's people putting the fibers in the molds and putting the resin in and, mm -hmm. and it just costs a lot of hours. And, and, and Norway, it's a particularly expensive country to, to make things. Yeah, it, w it wouldn't make sense to, to do a large production line, I think. Um, but it depends a little bit. When you look at price points in the 350,000 range, then you're starting to get into a, a world where it, it could be possible in, in terms of our calculations. But, but that's not where we want to be if we want to, want to compete with other LSAs on the land uh, market. The high end carbon composite two seat LSAs, the highest price. Prices are around 200, 220,000. So, sorry, when you say LSA, what do you mean? A light, light sport aircraft ah, okay. and, uh, you know, 600 kilo micro, micro lights and those types of uh, mm -hmm. certification. Okay. So we, we, you want to be competitive there. It can be a little bit more expensive because it's a seaplane, but it shouldn't be like 100,000 more. In the US, you can buy a relatively, you know, a relatively good used Cirrus and a Porsche for 350 or 400,000. And it doesn't seem right that, that a small two seat plane like this should be in that, you know, that price range. But, you know, th those things are very difficult because that's, uh, that's something that the prices will give themselves during the uh, development of the production process. Mm -hmm. And I think many companies are surprised when they get to that level and they start really seeing, oh, how were, was our calculations done in terms of production? and they end up much more expensive than what they said. You know, the icon back in 2009 was $139,000. And they've gone from that to 300 and I don't know, something, which is uh, remarkably more expensive than they promised their first customers. Mm -hmm. So we are always very careful with giving any sort of prices before we get to, you know, the full production line and can yep. see everything clearly. Because what's the plan now? You this is not certified yet, so I guess the first thing would be no, to certify um, it. To be quite honest with you, uh, we've published a little bit about this, but the P2 had a lot of issues on the water. We we had problems with the the sea wings or the float wings mm -hmm. that we designed. So we went in the water mid 2019, uh, started to test the airplane, and found out that uh, there's something wrong. You know, the bow wave is hitting the wings, and we 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 didn't dare to try to take off. We didn't dare to go above like 30 knots in the water. It was to look too dangerous, basically. So we uh, we ended up doing a lot of uh, tests on uh, on scale models again like we normally do in the beginning of a process and uh, try to figure out if there was something we could do with the hull. So we, we found the solution so that that would be uh, that would be one direction to go is to change the hull a little bit uh, to accommodate uh, to land on the sea. That's why you don't see any film of it uh, landing or taking off in the sea is because frankly speaking it did not work that well and we are changing it to to deal with that but as a small company with very limited resources uh it's always a very timely question to ask whether or not you should go into the the prototype again and start changing things or if you st should start working on version 2.0 right that's always the question and uh, in my my mind right now it, it makes sense to use the resources to build version 2.0 Really, um, if there were funding to say, yeah, we want to demo this particular prototype as quickly as possible in the water, then we can go ahead and do that kind of plan. But right now, it looks like I'd be I'd be more interested in maybe building number two because it's not just the water part. Once you start flight testing, you also find find other things you want to improve. So there are quite a we have a long list of things that I want to improve with the plane. Uh, aerodynamic uh, things, uh, nothing dangerous, but improvements that can make the efficiency even better. And um, if you're also looking at doing a pure electric plane, 
the challenge is really that you want to have more batteries for those two people to go far. So our idea right now is to make the aircraft a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger, accommodate it to be a potential four-seater. But in the beginning, it will be a two-seater with a lot of batteries. Mm-hmm. And that's that, in that way, you can get above the two and a half, three-hour endurance. And I think once you cross the two-hour endurance mark with reserve, I think there's a mental thing that happens with, with people that, okay, now it's, now it's usable as a traveling aircraft. Mm-hmm. Because most of the trips we take when we go abroad, and etc., we fly for approximately one hour and 45 or two hours. And that's the time when we maybe want to go to the toilet, want to have a coffee before we go on and, you know, things like that. So if you have charging stations on the airports, then two hours is very, it's a usable uh, amount of time. Um, yeah. One hour is, is good for training, you know, uh, that's yeah. good for training purposes. But if, you, if we had the, a concept that had uh, two more seats available potentially, then as the battery technology improves, this aircraft can evolve, evolve into more types of markets, right? Yeah. Is this um, the P4? You, you have on your website a mention to a, a poten- hypothetical P- a P4 yeah. aircraft with or larger we, we, it, The temporary name is just X4 now because the P okay. actually stands for Pushel, which is the original okay. equator design. But this new one will be more in line with, uh, let's say, uh, it has a lot of our own assumptions and ideas. Yeah. It has... Uh, we already lifted the wings, so it yeah. has a mid-wing, uh, a small float on the tip of the wing, yeah. etc. So there are many changes that we've made. Yeah, sorry, I said P4, it's actually X4, yes. I, yeah, X4. I just, I remember having read it somewhere in your website, but... Yeah, so, 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 <laughs> so when, we, when, we get, when we go out and, and introduce this to investors, that's what we, that's what we propose to them, is that we spend the, spend the funding to do the X4, basically, mm-hmm. as the production version of the, of the prototype. You're a startup company. Are you privately funded? Are you looking for new investors now? We, we had a, the first seed round in 2000, beginning of 2019, and it was a crowdfunding uh, scheme. So we did that. Um, but uh, because of all the things that happened with the prototype and because the efforts of doing the funding and because of COVID, <laughs> I mean we we uh, we did not uh, we did not um, we did not get uh, get to the goal with that last year what was the goal and uh, to get more to get funded uh, to yeah, get it, more funding what what figure specifically if, if it can be shared or... uh, yeah there are there are various uh, various figures but but uh, to be able to do uh, the full let's say an aircraft from start to finish we are looking for in the realm of you know 1.5 million dollars to begin with us or uh, euros approximately Mm -hmm. in that scope somewhere and uh, and that would bring us to a state where we have a a more or less production ready prototype and then you would need more funding to do a production line but but that's basically what we've been been looking for. But we don't have a, a CFO in the company, so it's all just us trying to reach out to people and things like that. But but to be quite honest, I, I I also didn't feel ready last year to do it because of the it's it was kind of a disappointment that the P2 didn't work that well in Walter. Mm-hmm. So we had to kind of regroup and figure out how we wanted to proceed and. Uh, and uh, it's not until now that the X4 is kind of materialized to a level where I can say, okay, we are ready to, to build it. And then, then we will try to talk to partnerships again and, and figure out how to fund it. But uh, last year was not a good year. I mean, everything closed down and, and investments in aerospace isn't ex- exactly the most uh, attractive. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, it was a hard year for everyone. Well, I mean, if... There are people in the audience that are in the in the financial community and are interested. Just uh, <laughs> let's see, maybe someone can reach out and and get interested. We we have some interesting dialogues going on with uh, a few companies and partners in Norway now. So I, I think there will be some interesting developments in the next years. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm pretty I'm pretty confident. But uh, right now, Equator is partly consulting and doing other work as well. So uh, we are involved with. Uh, designing also uh, larger seaplanes 10 seat seaplanes so that's okay. uh, that's still very quite i can't share much detail uh, unfortunately mm-hmm. but 
that is that has always been basically the end game for Equator. That was the vision was to get to the level where we can start to really work on aerial mobility mm-hmm. as a as a main thing. Yeah. And uh, as we this is kind of a segue into the Norwegian market, but as you see in Norway where you have 90% of the flights are less than one hour. These aircraft are flying from very small hubs across mm-hmm. all of Norway. There are about, uh, I can't remember, the, we, we have quite, quite a lot of airports. Um, Actually, I must say in the coming days, I'm going to have here in the podcast, one of the top executives of uh, Avinor, which is the Norwegian Airport Authority. Um, Don't fault Pedersen maybe or... And no, he, oh, I, he he's uh, a CEO, he's stopped, but um, he's CEO, yeah, yeah I, I cannot say much yet because it's not uh, 100% closed yet, but uh, possibly we're going to have the responsible from sustainable area, the sustainability yeah. area, because Avinor is making a big, is a big player in, in when it comes to pushing forward the sustainable mm. aviation agenda in, in Norway and, and in Europe. And we're going yeah. we're gonna, to uh, talk about how, yeah, all these a uh, large network of airports in in Norway it's uh, expected to to be a, a major fact in in electrifying aviation in in Norway and and how mm. yeah the conditions of the country are perfectly suitable for this type of move yeah yeah and uh, the the point is that if you can make uh, a lot of seaplane hubs you could go very much directly from city to city in Norway yeah, and uh, there are many many routes that would be very profitable mm-hmm. if you can make an efficient uh, route. And uh, the whole point with going electric on that kind of realm is there are two points. One is the noise level, so that you can get closer to those cities. But the second thing is really that the cost level goes down so much, uh, 60, 70 percent on the on the uh, on the maintenance of the aircraft. If you do composite and electric in the same uh, in the same job, uh, uh, that sorry, they, they can't. It's six or seventy percent compared to conventional uh, seaplanes. Yeah, not because with land uh, planes, huh? because, uh, because seaplanes, not, not uh, with not with land planes now. But yeah. but but uh, if you if you look at the, today's market the way it is, it's it's run by a lot of co- very old concepts. So you have uh, everything from Beaver to Cessna two hundred sixes to Cessna Caravan. And then there are some new one, new ones on floats, Kodiak Quest, etc. But all of these were aircraft that were never designed to go in the water. Really, they mm-hmm. they are land planes that have been modified with floats, and that's why when you go into salt water with these airplanes, the designers never had that in mind. I think that they operate in a salt water environment. Yeah, it's all metal. It's all metal. So you have yeah. to take it apart and check it many yeah. times and when it corrodes the parts of course are super expensive engines yeah. get damaged and you have to always always make sure everything is lubricated everything is covered and it's completely different from land planes so when we did cost analysis on these types of operations i was shocked to see the pricing or, or the, the cost of operating a small cessna 206 for instance it's very very high and yeah. that means that you you don't really have much margin. You can't make you can't make a lot of money on that that operation unless you have thousands of planes or many many planes and and fill them up all the time with uh, some you know fixed revenue streams like cargo or like they mm-hmm. do in Canada. In Canada, they have companies that can make money off it, but it has to be continuous revenue stream of uh, fixed contracts, basically. Yeah. Um, that would be a huge transition to electric because the electric planes would reduce this price to a level where you would earn money on two passengers. You know, uh-huh. you would earn money maybe even on one passenger. Yeah. And, and that's where you jump into the realm of on-demand uh, taxi services. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. The, the savings would be because being composite and having less moving parts, it's going to be cheaper to do the maintenance. Or are there first, other off, first off, you, you have to design a plane that is fully composite, right? So the only metal you're using is some titanium, but the rest is composite. If the aircraft is completely plastic, it could run for 100 years in salt water without getting destroyed, mm-hmm. right? So if it's designed from the onset to take a salt water environment, then, it's, then it would be very, very different from what exists today. Um, the second thing is the electric uh, drivetrain, which is it's just 
very very simple you know you do you have one moving part you change the bearing every 10,000 hours and make sure it's uh you know watertight and then everything that 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 is a that is a huge difference from what we have today in the combustion realm so if you even look away from the green part of it which is the, like the biggest selling point the it's huge from a mechanical standpoint and a, and a sustainable standpoint sustain, sustainability standpoint in running a business basically so there's there's money to be made and that's why i believe in mm -hmm. it would be easier to get investments for a larger commuter aircraft than maybe a small sports plane in the beginning because mm -hmm. frankly speaking it's a it's a great business case that's uh, that's yeah. what we're seeing right now yeah i had um, um i had on uh, here in the podcast a few days ago the founder of uh, an australian seaplane operator and he was talking about all this cost and the corrosion and he said, literally, yeah. it's like a war. We are at war yeah. with the yeah. sea, sea water. <laughs> yeah, we, exactly, it, exactly. It requires yeah. um, huge maintenance for every, every time the, the airplane hits the water. Yeah, of, uh, and, it's, and, and you can also use a metaphor uh, like a, a fireman uh, putting out the fire here on this side. And mm -hmm. when you've done that, immediately there's a new fire there. It yeah. will always be like this throughout the plane, mm -hmm. right? So... So, so this is what we need to get away from to be able yeah. to make seaplanes an attractive financial mm -hmm. uh, direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the electric and the composite technology of 2021 has the potential to do this. And, and that, I think, will be what uh, hopefully will be the legacy of Equator is that we managed to get involved with that, develop mm -hmm. these products and also change the way that we use uh, aircraft, really, because that would, that would shift the way that every that the whole network is done you know potentially mm -hmm. interesting um, it's very very exciting that part on your website you mentioned that you are cooperating with a danish seaplane operator yeah uh, nordic, nordic seaplanes nordic mm -hmm. seaplanes out of denmark which i think yeah. they run the the route between copenhagen and aarhus which is the yeah. second the second largest city i think of uh, denmark yeah which is yeah. across the water. So um, yeah. one is in the, in the mainland, the other is in the island. What's the plan here? I mean, it's, it's to research these uh, yeah. larger yeah. seaplanes or? Yeah, so we, we think uh, as, you know, as designers, we think it's very important to, to really get to know uh, the, the, the end customer in a way, because uh, uh, for instance, uh, for instance, in this case, the idea would be to to have a cooperation where we are we are um, we are with them, and we uh, we try to we try to document very closely uh, the operations in detail. We try to figure out uh, what are the complications of using, uh, in their case, a, a twin otter on floats. Uh, what what are the pain points in their daily daily operations? What are the cost? What are the cost drivers? What are the things that we can solve? And uh, if we have uh, a, a kind of a partner like this, and maybe another one as well that is a potential end customer, then we can we can design something that is more in line with what they want right so it's really important to have this early in the design process and that's why we we, uh, we partnered because first of all they are interested in uh, electric uh, because they are operating so close to the city so it would be good for them to to be able to have that as a as a potential future scenario and uh, on our side we really want to make the best pos possible product so all the information we can get from them on their operations is uh, is valuable to our process, and that's how we uh, we got in in contact. And it really was uh, the manager there, uh, Lasse Rungholm, who reached out to us and uh, explained that he was very interested in going green at some point, uh, especially because De Denmark also has incentives in place for companies that do that. So. He was wondering basically how long could it take to make something that we could use on these routes. And, and uh, we had some exciting conversations and uh, we will continue as we conceptualize this, this larger aircraft and make sure that we hit kind of the points that they are interested in. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, Scandinavia is one of the focus points for sustainable aviation and Norway in particular has a very ambitious target i think it's mm. to make all flying all domestic flying carbon free mm. by 2030 or 2040 i don't remember now 
but it's 40 I yeah it's so but but uh, yeah i i think it's been the first country that has set up a specific date date deadline for that and yeah. uh, there's a number of initiatives trying to push forward this electric and, mm. and, and more than electric i mean sustainable uh, mm. flying agenda how do you fit into this uh, whole program Eco yeah yeah well we we are in norway the only company that you know develop aircraft right so uh, so that uh, and we, we today you could say equator is a prototyping agency with speciality in electric propulsion so that's why we're having all these interesting conversations now because the way that the government has set forth this agenda, it's making a lot of other companies in Norway looking, suddenly looking at this and then starting to research this. And we are usually maybe the, the, the second or the third call that they make because when they start researching, oh, we have this company in Norway, they're doing seaplanes. They usually contact us maybe to do or to discuss conventional electric planes, which is fine. But I usually, usually try to convince them that if you invest in a plane, let's, let's go this direction, make, make the network even bigger than you thought. You know, because the seaplanes, if they are efficient, can be used from point to point between the, the airports, no problem. But the, the fact that you can go from airport to harbor, back to airport, to another harbor, to a harbor, to an airport, it makes for a dramatic shift in the whole environment. So these companies suddenly realize this, and and that's why we are in all these discussions right now. So that's how we fit into the ecosystem is that we are a service provider more or less to these companies where they can come to us and actually we can develop the aircraft they want, right? Mm -hmm. Or or we can convert a plane or we can do we can do many things, right? But it's uh, it's all down to the strategies that these companies want to lay out. Another thing you do also is uh, you are preparing to take part in the first air race the mm. uh, only by uh, all electric aircraft the yes, air yes. race e i'm gonna have here in the podcast the person that is is behind this initiative in in, mm. in a few days few weeks time mm. i mean we are we are arranging it but um for the time being what can you tell us about this project uh you are not gonna race with a seaplane right you're gonna have you you have modified a different aircraft but it's gonna be a all electric race so basically it's gonna be like what eight ten teams that are gonna be flying eight. uh yeah eight teams flying around a circuit mm. and yeah so basically like a formula one type of thing just that flying right yeah yeah and it probably will be the, one of the fastest motorsports in the world, like 450 kilometers per hour and full gas for eight minutes. This is, this is not something we decided on our own. Uh, there was a group in Norway of uh, enthusiasts and also a, a test pilot that was very interested to become a race pilot in this race uh, and is also very interested in uh, green technology. So they reached out to us and asked, you know, if this was interesting. From Equator point of view, it's interesting because we get to do a drive system 2.0. Uh, the drive system in the, the P2 is one level, and now we have the chance to go to a higher level, and we also get to test these components under crazy environments, right? So we can really push all the components to a, to a, to a maximum level. Uh, it's going to give us a lot of valuable experience with drivetrains that will that will that we'll be able, we can put into projects in the X4 category or in the 10 seat category or whatever it may be in the future. But getting more knowledge on battery technology, BMS, uh, inverter and, con and controller and the motor technology is, uh, is something that's very interesting because we, are, we, we, we don't make the components, but we integrate into the airframe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're always trying to find better ways to do it, to make the cooling right, to make all the technical connections right. Uh, so, so this gives us another opportunity to just benchmark us, ourselves a little bit higher. Uh, and because it's a second system, we also believe we can do it very rapidly and efficiently and, and, and get this aircraft on, uh, in the air very quickly. Um, it's a conversion project, right? So we found an, ele we found a not an electric, but a, a race plane in Norway um, a year ago, actually. Uh, it was on Swedish uh, registry. Uh, so we spent a year with this other company trying to get it on Norwegian registry. That's hard enough as, a, as it is an experimental aircraft. It's, so, it's sometimes difficult with these uh, 
getting them certified as experimentals as well. But, uh, but that happened uh, right before Christmas. So we flew, we test flew this a few days ago and we published a small video on, online. And the idea with it is really, we, we want to publish much more from this process because we are dependent on getting uh, sponsorships for this, uh, this project. So we have some private investment there, but we, we want to fund it up with uh, more sponsors. So, so we probably will do more publishing around this project on the process as well. Yeah, so the sponsors out there, you've heard it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you want your name to, on this, yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah, no excuses. They um, they can reach out to you and and sponsor this very very exciting project. They're planning uh, the first race in twenty two, and uh, I think that they want to have a test race at the end of the year, like October November, maybe in Spain even where you are. And then uh, the challenge really in this project is that the air racer has to be airborne latest july august to be able to make that date so it's a very very short project so we have uh, we have a lot to do with that mm -hmm. yeah hopefully i will uh, be able to learn more about it when i interview here in the podcast the, the founder of, of this project so mm. hopefully we'll be able to share a few more details. oh yeah you'll, you'll learn yeah. everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah it definitely can raise awareness of all the work that is being done on, mm. on electric powertrains and, and electric aviation. In the yeah, meantime, it's, a, it's yeah. very exciting. It's very exciting and it's developed so fast. The last 10 years, it's expanded exponentially. From when I started, when there was nothing in the big fairs, to today, it's, there are hundreds of companies. So it's, it's an ex exciting time mm -hmm. to be uh, in aviation and doing design work, for sure. For in the meantime, for people that want to learn more about Equator, what's the best way to find out? Can you share a website, uh, other channels you might have, YouTube? Other, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It's uh, equatoraircraft.com, one word. And uh, if you go to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, then it's all Equator Aircraft, one word. And then you'll find find our sites and we try to we didn't publish much last year but this year we'll, we are going to try to increase uh, publishing and, uh, and showing a little bit more of what we do we'll keep an eye on it thank great. you very much thomas it's been great to learn about this very exciting project and thank wish you. you all the best with all these efforts the the racing the fundraising and the and the new iteration of your electric seaplane thank you very much before you go, and if you like this podcast, a quick reminder that it would be absolutely great if you could please give it a rating on Apple, Spotify, or whichever platform you are using, or recommend it to a friend or whomever might be interested. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Yeah.